Welcome to episode 204 of the G2 on 5G. It's the latest insight scoop on everything 5G. We cover six topics in about 20 minutes, and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend, and joining me again this week is fellow analyst Anshul Sag. So we are recording the Friday before Labor Day. So we just want to wish all of our listeners and viewers a very happy Labor Day. Anshul, it doesn't sound like you're going to take a day off. You're headed to, to Berlin, right? Yes, I'll be at IFA right before the Apple event uh, the following week. Yeah. Um, but I, I wanted to, uh, you know, help people get in the mood of the holiday and and show them the beaches, San Diego. Um, nice. and, uh, maybe some people will enjoy the beaches this weekend for the last time uh, before, yeah. you know, the holidays are over or vacation is over. Yeah. It's the, the 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 dog days of summer are about to end here, and um, I will be uh, watching my Longhorns play their home opener in Austin against uh, Colorado State, um, the Rams. Fort Collins is a favorite place of mine. I have a little bit of rental property there as well, but I will definitely be voting or rooting for the Longhorns this weekend. But well, hey, let's jump into it. I want to hit my first topic, and I caught this um, article on the Fierce Network, and it was an interview with AT&T's uh, head of AI, and um, he was talking about how important generative AI is to their overall strategy, and it's it's very broad, uh, but it got me thinking, if it's too broad, is it going to you know lose its value? And you and I have talked about what AT&T has done in the past with NVIDIA and intelligent truck rolls and that sort of thing. Um, certainly at and is leaning into it for that. What I found interesting in this article, and it was written by uh, Julia King, is that um, they're, they're using generative AI to um, even do things like understand the network life cycle tied to retiring copper, which is something that we've talked about. And certainly fixed wireless access and internet air, that announcement that AT&T made um, is intended to be sort of a copper catch and move people off of legacy infrastructure. But I found it interesting that um, beyond chatbots, beyond the intelligent chuck rolls, that um, their head of AI and his name, um, I'm probably going to uh, kind of mess it up, but it's Raj Savor, actually. Didn't mess that one up, but um, but Raj's you know thought process and strategy with Gen AI is to be very you know very wide and very pervasive with it, using it um, not only to again evaluate legacy infrastructure and apply AI to sort of understand how to move subscribers off of that, but hey, this whole concept of an autonomous network and this is something that we continue to hear certainly would be very powerful when you think about a mobile network operator and the dependency that we all have on, on mobile communications. But you know what? You know, it's like a baseball game, like your Padres or my Astros, man. It's early innings and uh, with generative AI. A um, lot of announcements this week around NVIDIA. I still can't believe that they just killed it with earnings, yet all the bubble bears, as I like to call them out there, uh, Cause the stock to, to retreat. But obviously, there's a lot of promise with Gen AI. What AT&T is doing is going to be very expansive. But from your perspective, I mean, is it too expansive? I mean, can this can these things that, that they're doing, like with evaluating legacy technology and driving towards more of autonomy, I mean, is there real value in that? Or is it just sort of window dressing? I think it's a way for them to save on costs, to be honest with yeah. you. It feels like it's a cost optimization, you know, effort. Um, and mm -hmm. I think if you look at the size of a company like AT&T, um, there's probably a lot of things that um, could be optimized that aren't just because of the size of the company. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's actually a, a positive thing for them. Um, they, they can go out and find the things that they want to be more optimized and automated um, and do those. You know, the one thing I'm noticing is, Gen AI is very popular for customer service, um, yeah. both for ingestion, but also for problem solving. And I'm mm -hmm. sure there's billions of dollars to be saved just for AT&T alone. Um, sure. So I, I think there's just so many opportunities um, within an organization the size of AT&T that I think Gen AI, when it's properly implemented 
with with good leadership, um, it can actually be very beneficial, and it's not just window dressing. Yeah, well, I was kind of a softball tee up. I, I feel the same that you do. I, I think it can be very transformative, and it's still early innings, you know, getting back to my baseball analogy. So uh, it'll be fun to see how this all kind of unfolds. But with that, um, your first topic, you want to talk about Apple. And I know that it's almost that time of the year, right, where they reveal new iPhones and, and other stuff. Yes. So uh, Apple sent out invites earlier this week uh, for a September 9th event. Um, that will be at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, and it will be an iPhone 16 launch, um, which many people expect to be a very AI focused event, which no surprise there. Um, yeah. the expectation is that there will probably be a new A6, A18 chip, which will probably only ship in the Pro models. Um, and then all of the A17 stuff um, will trickle down to the rest of the iPhones um, from last year. And then um, there's probably going to be expect, you know, expectations for a new Apple Watch, you know, maybe some AirPods updates. Um, but I think that's kind of going to be it. I'll be surprised if they announce any new MacBooks, even though the expectation is that they're going to move up MacBooks as well. Because mm -hmm. Apple, like with the exception of the iPhone, everything's kind of being announced early. I mean, even even like a lot of the AI stuff, um, they announced it. It's already been rolled out. Yeah. 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 They, well, that's the thing. It's not been rolled out. A lot of it's been announced in beta. Well, that's what I mean. Announced. Exactly. Yeah, but but yeah. I'm saying usually Apple will hold some of these things until the new device is launched, but they wanted to get them out there during WWDC. And like yeah. some of them won't even be available. Like the new Siri won't be available till next year. So there's a lot of like, everyone is trying to jockey for AI dominance and AI position. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot more talk of AI uh, during this Apple launch than I think we've probably ever seen. Um, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the competition responds, of course. Um, but in general, I think it'll be mostly iPhone focused. Um, we will get probably some wearable updates and I don't think we'll get MacBooks until maybe October or November. Hmm. Yeah, well, it's that time of year. Everyone gets really excited, you know, wondering, you know, what's coming. So it, it kind of sounds to me like, I don't know, I, I just kind of sense it in your voice that nothing too earth shattering. Is no, that an accurate it, well, take? It almost never is with Apple. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. Well, a lot, you know, a lot of people like to make a big deal about it, but uh, oh, yes, they do. I mean, I'm an Apple user and I've got an ultra watch, you know, hey, you know, I like the products, but uh, it is what it is. Hey, let me go to my second topic. I want to talk about Deutsche Telekom, and they've been talking about their plans to roll out 5G standalone for quite some time. They're still sticking to their guns, and I mean, it's it's getting pretty late, man. So we're we're pushing into September here, and it's interesting. Apparently, what what they're they're going to do from a strategy perspective here. So they recently announced, and this was uh, again another article on the Fierce Network. They, they've announced a 5G gaming option based on 5G standalone and network slicing. And they're partnering with also in London Lab for the service. And this is a new um, entry for them into cloud gaming. What's interesting is that it appears that this is the first of potentially a series of very bespoke service offerings that leverage 5G standalone, so core, matching the core to the RAM. And, and we've often talked, you know, on numerous podcasts that you can't get to slicing until you have standalone. So that, that unlocks standalone. And that um, Deutsche Telekom is not necessarily going to go just sort of broadly uh, deploy what they're calling 5G+, Plus, which is their standalone solution, but rather deploy it in sort of bespoke service kind of oriented um, uh, uh, fashion. I find that an interesting, number one, you know, the expectations for 5G have been set so high. And you and I have talked often about how this whole tweener with non-standalone and standalone kind of really mucked things up and how 3GPP is moving away from that as uh, we look at future iterations of G's and, and, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, 
this may actually be a positive thing in the German market because, again, expectations for 5G have been low. I mean, if you're just to sort of broadly deploy it at this point, I mean, could that create market confusion? Um, how would you go, you know, how would you monetize that? And so instead, the way they're going to go monetize this is with discrete services starting with cloud gaming and network slicing. So what do you think? I think it's an interesting approach. Um, yeah. I think it's um, it's basically thinking about monetization first and foremost. Yeah. And and how how do they monetize the cost of new core? Um, I do wonder whether they have the right infrastructure in place to offer the, a service, a paid service. Yeah. Um, like, is is it really in enough places? Is it robust enough? And you know, does it really? make it seem worthwhile for whoever mm -hmm. is paying for the service. I also yeah. wonder, is the is the end user paying for the service or is it the application developer? Like who's paying for this gaming service? That's the one mm -hmm. thing I, I don't quite fully understand. Yeah. Um, I did see this story. I didn't really look into it much, um, but I'm glad you picked it up. I had a feeling you would. Yeah, yeah you know, I'm I'm reading between the lines because it was somewhat broad. You know, it's sort of talking about this partnership with these two companies, and certainly those two companies they they have a vested interest, and so you know, they're you know I'm assuming the two of those companies and and DK, uh, Deutsche Telekom are going to split the revenue opportunity. I mean, from my perspective, you know, this is certainly something that as a subscriber you would pay for. Um, you know, and we've talked about this just with you know slicing in general. Um, and, you know, services and, and that sort of thing that are tied to it. Um, but it is interesting. I mean, the whole notion of, you know, not going broad with it, but being very, you know, bespoke to my point um, and offer it as a, as a, as a consumable service. I mean, um, it'll, it's going to be very interesting. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how this really, you know, kind of takes. And um, I'll actually be in Europe uh, in a couple of weeks for Connected Britain. And I'm going to spend some time with Deutsche Telekom, and I really want to get you know sort of a deeper understanding on where they're headed with that, and maybe I can share that on a future podcast. I would, but I would love to have tried it, but I don't think they're going to launch it by the time I'm in Germany. Yeah, um, but yeah, I looked into it a little more. It looks like it's literally a cloud gaming service bundle. Yeah, right? they get games and service, but it's not. It's an additional on top of their their connectivity. Right. Um, but yeah, like you know. The pricing structure obviously has to be right to pay for the the compute. Uh, yeah. You're already technically paying for the connectivity. I, I'm sure there's a little bit of extra you're paying for for the core upgrade, but yeah, like as a gamer, um, cloud gaming hasn't really taken hold, um, and I think a big part of that is the licensing um, and all the the intricacies of like having a game run in the cloud. Yeah. Um, but there are some games that are really great for it. So um, it'll be yeah. interesting to see how this works out. And I wish, I wish I'd be able to test it out, but it looks like it'll launch a few, probably a few weeks after I leave. Yeah. You may have to wait a little while there on that one. So, but Hey, let's go to your second topic and in, Insego. Wow. We haven't talked about Insego in quite a while. And um, you want to talk about um, an FWA router that they've recently launched and it's got the support of all three carriers in the U S right. Yeah, it's a pretty cool device, I think. Um, obviously, it's mostly for Insego to roll out for their customers. So right now, it's exclusively available through Insego Ignite Channel Partners. Um, but basically, this is a single device that operates on all three major carriers. Um, and it's an indoor FWA router. Um, and it's certified on those all three carriers. Um, and the cool part is it allows you to run on multiple carriers simultaneously. Um, so you can, it has dual SIM uh, and you can have different carriers based on like your coverage or where you are um, mm -hmm. and like what your billing is and what your agreements are with those carriers and like who you prefer to have a primary and who to have as a backup. Um, and it's really cool just because like, I feel like this simplifies the, FWA experience for small to medium businesses. Um, mm -hmm. And it can really make FWA way more attractive because now you can like, you know, oh, maybe I went over on my plan with this carrier and I can switch to the other one. Or, 
um, maybe I'm not really getting good speeds with this one. I'm going to switch to a different one. And you don't have to change your equipment. Um, basically just, you know, change the provisioning, which is easy as popping in a SIM. Um, yeah. And it's cool because it also has, um, you know, support for all kinds of uh, security capabilities, um, has advanced encryption, guest Wi-Fi, SASE capabilities, VPN, FIPS 142, and TAA compliance. So it's got all the security capabilities you would want to have in a, you know, an enterprise grade networking device, but also it seems really flexible, seems really easy to set up. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I'm excited about it. It seems kind of boring for some people. Um, mm -hmm. The technical name is the Insego WaveMaker FX3110. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's cool. It's unlocked. Um, and yeah, I just think it's, I think it's just like a really cool device that I think will help reduce friction in a lot of environments mm -hmm. where people might have um, some sensitivities. It has Snapdragon X62 5G modem, which is not um, necessarily the latest, um, but it is still pretty advanced modem. It has Wi-Fi 6. I was hoping this would have Wi-Fi 7, but maybe that's a little too advanced for this application. Yeah, I think because it's an it's an enterprise class router, um, that's why it's likely Wi-Fi six, just given uh, device support and that sort of thing. I do really like the flexibility with um, supporting multi-carrier, and if you think about it, this is really ideal for a business that has like um, potentially a lot of branch locations. Um, and you know, if you think about you know, coverage and and that sort of thing. You know, different different operators have different coverage maps depending on where you're at. So I really like that. And you know, when I think about some of Insego's competitors like Cradle Point, and I do spend a lot of time with Cradle Point, um, they tend to align with one carrier. And so like T-Mobile has been sort of their their go-to um, partner. And um, so anyway, I mean. I do, I do like the flexibility of the multi-carrier, the fact that the, you know, the device is unlocked. It just gives customers um, much more flexibility. Yeah. Also, it adds, want, yeah. they have support for US cellular as well, but I guess in the press release, they didn't think it was important to mention. No, I think aren't, they're, they're kind of on their last leg, right? I, mean, I know. I just thought it was Hasn't T-Mobile, hasn't T-Mobile? Kind you know, of, we'll see what happens. But kind of. I'll just add, um, this is a very simple looking device. It looks like a, um, you know, just a normal, uh, um, I don't know what to call it, but it does, it looks like it has an external antenna attachment, so you can get better signal if you want. Yeah. But it, it looks like a, an Apple router from, you know, back when they made those air, airport routers. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, other than that, you know, tons of in Seago software to manage it as well. Um, yeah. And it has two ethernet connections, um and a dual dual sim connections as well usb port for for management as well um and it's it does not look like it supports millimeter wave um it looks like it's only sub six um but it does have four by four mimo um yeah. pretty good for 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 you know getting decent speeds yeah nice package there well, hey, um, let's go hit my third and final topic. And I, I know you're going to weigh in on this one, man. So I want to talk about the U.S. Rural 5G Fund. And oh, man, we've been talking about this for years, right? I mean, this dates back to the Trump administration when your favorite FCC chairman, Pai, was running things. So what's interesting is that just recently, and this was something that I caught in RCR Wireless. So Sean Kinney and team, thanks for the, the inspiration here. But there are plans uh, that are underway to reignite this fund. And uh, just for a history lesson for our viewers and listeners, this is $9 billion that, that was dedicated. And it's been sort of on pause for the last four years. I mean, going all the way back to 2020. And, you know, originally the, the, the design was, or the plan was, the mission was, to address the, the over 14, 15 million homes and businesses nationwide that lack access to 5G. And so this was an attempt, you know, this was way before Beats. This is an attempt to sort of, you know, level the playing field. You and I talked, you know, quite frankly about, hey, you know, it wasn't going to be enough. I mean, it just wasn't, you know, given given the um, the scope. But 
now the current FCC chairman is, uh, you know, Jessica Rosenworcel is uh, ready to revisit this. And, you know, to her point, she was quoted in this article as saying, we are ready to use every tool available to make sure that those who live, work, and travel in rural America have access to advanced 5G mobile wireless broadband services. So I don't know if you, you caught this or you dug into it, man, but what do you think? I mean, can this thing really... Can it can it be a game changer? I'm I'm not convinced to be honest with you, yeah. um, because we first of all it's been kind of languishing yeah. uh, for quite some time, and they've been talking about re you know reigniting or resetting this fund earlier this year already, so this isn't really like that new of news. But like I yeah. also don't really know like what are they going to do differently? How are they going to take advantage of this? $9 billion sure. dollars in a way that wasn't, you know, other than the fact they weren't doing anything with it. Right. Um, you know, like, how do they maximize the impact of that $9 billion? Um, right. I, I would love to know. Um, but I, I think ultimately uh, what I believe is that, um, you know, allowing people to have choice um, and, 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 maybe even trying to help them find the rest, the best solution for what they're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I actually think Starlink um, have, have overplayed their hand in terms of how applicable they believe um, Starlink is to bridging the this divide. However, yeah. however, I also believe Starlink should be an option for people when no other options are available. So yeah. I, think, I think that they're... Um, you know, I, I don't think everybody should be on Starlink. I also don't think nobody should be on Starlink. So I think Starlink should be one of the options and it should be like, you know, creating a, a like a stack of like, okay, does this apply to this area? Yes or no? And just move yeah. the flow chart because I just feel like in rural America, it's it's very much the opposite of one size fits all. Um, yeah. and, it's, and it's expensive to try and do anything. So I think, you know, Thinking through this process, um, they've already been doing that, but you know nobody executed anything. So I would rather that we like actually have a, a an approach that makes sense. Um, but the problem is like satellite technology. I think will um, be the, the best way to address most of this, um, mm -hmm. especially since rural areas are way less densely populated. Um, but we're not really there yet. You know, we're probably three or four years until satellites mature enough. Um, but I, I didn't even hear any talk about satellite for rural in this. No, coverage. yeah, so that's, think, a, that's a good point. Yeah, that that's just my thoughts. No, no, I mean, I, I think your thoughts are dead on, and you're right. It's interesting. Like, where's satellite in this conversation? And you know, we've got um, AST Space Mobile that's about to launch its first tranche of of commercial satellites um, next month. Is it's expected. You've got Starlink that's got, you know, direct to device, you know, testing going on, but it's going to, it's going to take both companies to your point, a couple of years to get enough birds in the air that, you know, you've got a constellation that can, can actually do what it intends to do. So, yes. yeah, it just seems like it's sort of a retread, a, a rehash. And to your point, I think if they really want to sort of free these funds, they need to be less prescriptive about you know demanding you know the the up and down throughput performance and more you know more focused on how do you get creative and and begin to use some of these funds to 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 do to do some good and get some connectivity in there but anyway it'll be interesting to see how the, this thing kind of continues to to kind of roll out but Hey, let's hit your third and final topic. And I did catch this as well. I didn't go deep into it, but I'm, I'm looking forward to getting your perspective on Huawei. And they're just continuing. They're the Energizer bunny, man. Their, their revenue continues to rebound. Um, and you want to sort of talk about that growth and, and that profitability. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you look at Huawei, they've obviously reinvented themselves in a lot of ways. Um, you know, they're now an automotive company. Um, they're working on, you know, shipping autonomous vehicles. Um, they're also still doing networking and, and building 5G infrastructure. Um, they seem to be really pushing 5G advanced quite a, quite a bit um, yeah. and wanting to do that in the markets where it makes sense for them. Um, and I think they're probably, you know, working on improving their 
their their you know uh, revenue um, and and also profit. So their their revenue was up thirty four percent year on year, and, yeah. 17, and their and their net profit was up seventeen percent year on year. So they are, um, you know, they're they're growing. Um, for a company that was once considered dying or dead, um, so they've they've refused to, um, you know, go away. Is the best way of putting it. Yeah. Um, and, and if you look at their smartphones, um, you know, they're they're pretty close in terms of their other Chinese competitors. I wouldn't say that they're necessarily the best. Um, mm -hmm. I think you know, Oppo, Vivo, uh, Xiaomi are. They've so come a long much. way. Oppo, especially, has come a long way, huh? Yeah, and. I think when you look at like the Chinese market, it's the most competitive, one of the most competitive smartphone markets. Um, so they have challenges there just from competition. But the reality is Huawei has the most brand recognition in China um, because it's like, you know, it's basically like the Ford or Chevy of, of China. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think it's really interesting to see that, you know, there's cloud that they're still taking advantage of. Um, and I, I think they're doing a good job of, um, growing within the footprint that they can um and you know last year they were a hundred billion dollar company so um they're still quite a large company and they will most likely pass a hundred billion dollars this year so um yeah. that's that's still quite sizable um and yeah i think that when you look at like what they're doing in automotive um the chinese automakers are growing and uh, i think they're a real threat to uh, American automakers and European automakers, um, and Huawei is one of those companies where, um, you know, they do phones, they do wearables, they also do cars. Yeah. So I, I think they have they have the kind of supply chain um, that can enable them to be competitive on a global scale. I just think that like you know the Huawei Mate 70 Pro looks pretty good, but I don't think you're going to see it in a lot of places. Um, yeah. and they're still kind of operating with inferior chips so um you know I, I think in general uh they will be competitive but they will never really get to the point where they used to be before before all of this yeah i mean all the the entity you know listing right has prevented them from getting access to the top you know latest and greatest silicon right from the likes of qualcomm and mediatek and, and others and there have been rumors about you know they're taking their high silicon um, business unit, which is not a fabricator, but just a designer, and trying to you know to fab it out. But that's a huge lift, man. That's like billions of dollars, right? And 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 not only billions of dollars in capex, but um, the knowledge to do that yeah. and and access to machinery from the likes of. Um, What's the company that that has a huge presence in Austin? Um, there's Lamb, and then there's um, I'm forgetting the name of the company, but but just getting access to the actual machinery to fab, you know, is going to be difficult for them as well. But I was yeah. just going to add one more thing. Um, I saw this news piece uh, earlier this week. Um, China is using Huawei's polar um, codes in its submarine data transmission. So, what the hell? Um, I saw one of my friends is a uh, ROV guy for yeah. underwater. Like he's literally one of the world leading guys on ROVs. And he posted about the polar codes from Huawei. And I'm like, dude, this was like in 5G. It never really got implemented anywhere. But like this was a Huawei Crazy. technology. Um, and it was really interesting to see that Huawei technology is now in Chinese submarines. That's crazy. Applied Materials was the company that I was. Oh yeah, Applied Materials. Yeah, they're but big. They're, they're big, big in the everywhere. valley too. They're big. They're big everywhere. But yeah, they they've got a big presence just right outside of Austin. So, well, hey, my friend, um, it was another great podcast as we enter the long Labor Day weekend. Why don't you take us home? Absolutely. We hope our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. If anyone out there would like to provide insights on a specific five G topic for a future podcast, please reach out to us on social media. Will's at Welltel Tech and I'm at Anshel Saad. We hope you have a great weekend and please tune in again next week and don't forget to rate and subscribe.